This podcast is brought to you by Podcast Nation. Welcome to As a Woman, Fertility Hormones and Beyond. I'm your host, Dr. Natalie Crawford, and I am a board-certified OBGYN and fertility physician and also co-founder of Fora Fertility in Austin, Texas. Each week on this podcast, I discuss health and fertility and how they relate to your true self. Become a part of the community of collaboration that amplifies others as a woman. I hope you enjoy the episode. Hello, and welcome back to the As A Woman podcast. Today, we're talking about the two-week wait, what I want you to know about your hormones, tips, tricks, just what you can do to be your best self and to help time pass in this really hard time period. First of all, welcome to the podcast. I'm so thankful that you are here. If you are new here, this podcast has so many episodes, probably whatever question you're looking for, I have answered. And if I haven't, I do Q&A episodes where I answer your questions. So you can call and leave your own voicemail at 657-229-3672. Again, that is 657-229-3672. The As A Woman voicemail will be played. You can be anonymous if you want, but I'll answer whatever question you have. You may not realize that on the website at nataliecrawfordmd.com, we have a resources section where you can type in PCOS or endometriosis or progesterone, and it will pull up all the content I have on that topic. So whether it is a blog post, a podcast episode, a YouTube video, you can see everything related to that one topic right there. You can also go to nataliecrawfordmd.com slash newsletter and sign up for the weekly newsletter. The newsletter includes recipes, my favorites, fertility in the news, hot takes, and your questions. So ask questions Mondays on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD. You will find some at the end of this episode in the For Fertility Sake segment. You will find some answered on Instagram and you will find some in the newsletter. All right, well, let's start out and say, what is the two-week wait? The two-week wait is the time period between ovulation and your positive pregnancy test or your next period. Essentially, the two-week wait is the luteal phase. So in order to really understand the two-week wait the best, you need to understand your hormones and what it is and what it isn't. And that's going to give you a lot of insight into this time period. Personally, I like to think of this as pregnant until proven otherwise. This is that time where it is too soon to take a pregnancy test, but you very well may be pregnant. We just may not know. And so in this time period, we are going to be trying to take care of ourselves in the absolute best way possible. This is when progesterone is high. This is when implantation happens. And this is when your mind is going to play tricks on you. So let's think about ovulation really quickly because that is the essence of understanding the hormones and the two-week wait. So remember that I like the analogy that inside the ovary is a vault where all your eggs are kept. At the start of a month, a whole group of eggs becomes available. Each egg grows inside a follicle. Egg is microscopic and the follicle is a small fluid-filled structure you can see on ultrasound. At the start of the month, the brain is going to send out follicle-stimulating hormone or FSH. FSH is a well-named hormone and its job is to tell the follicle to grow. So it stimulates a follicle. It's so well named. Really the brain and the ovaries are in such a good communication because the brain senses every little picogram of estrogen made by the ovaries and it adjusts exactly how much FSH is released based on that estrogen. And this very tight communication is how the body ovulates just one egg. Because as it senses that estrogen is being made from a maturing egg, FSH is now decreased. So what happens? FSH stimulates an egg or a follicle. That follicle starts growing and the egg starts to mature. That maturing egg makes estrogen, which makes you feel good. This is the follicular phase, but it also stimulates the lining to grow and tells the brain, hey, we don't need any more FSH. Once that egg gets to maturity, and the only reason the brain knows it's mature is based on having a high enough level for a long enough time. So 200 picograms for 50 hours is approximately the amount of estrogen that the brain needs to then send out an LH surge. LH is a luteinizing hormone. This hormone is going to be released in a very high fashion right before ovulation. This is the surge that triggers you to ovulate. So the LH surge gets released from the pituitary gland. What is then happening is that follicle is going to rupture 
the cyst bursts, and the egg is released. Really, inside the egg, it is finalizing that last stage of meiosis, and so its chromosomes are separating, allowing it to become an egg that is mature enough to be fertilized by a sperm. Now, ovulation really starts the luteal phase, and the luteal phase is the time period of the cycle, the second half, where the body is stimulated by mostly LH from the brain, making progesterone from a corpus luteum. So what happens is that cyst, that follicle, after it releases the egg, it reforms. And now it is able to make progesterone. It is a corpus luteum. It is stimulated from pulses of LH from the brain. And it makes progesterone in subsequent pulses. So pulse comes from the brain, you get a pulse of progesterone. Then it drops back down. Then a pulse comes from the brain and you get a pulse of progesterone. And this happens the entire luteal phase. Meaning at any given moment, I may have higher low progesterone or higher low LH. Therefore, if you are using ovulation predictor kits, number one, these are urinary based kits used to detect the first LH surge that is triggering you to ovulate. So what we are looking for is for your body to be able to find that first surge. Once you get a positive, please stop taking the test. That is because LH is going to peak over and over again throughout the entire luteal phase. Now, when you do take the OPK, so small segue, if you're wanting to use OPKs for cycle tracking, they're checking a urinary LH concentration. Remember, LH is made from the pituitary gland, but the OPKs are a urinary-based kit. So that hormone has to get from your bloodstream into your urine, and that takes time. So LH is typically released in the early morning hours, but I do not recommend people check their urine if you're using an OPK until the middle of the day. That 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. time zone tends to be the best. And one time per day, when you get a positive, then you don't need to check anymore. LH is positive the day before you ovulate. So anticipate ovulation the next day. If you are targeting intercourse, target intercourse, day of positive, and the next day. Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well, with meals that work for you and not the other way around. In honor of Earth Month, Green Chef is offering a brand new collection of limited time recipes made with sustainable, earth-friendly ingredients throughout the entire month of April. These premium recipes feature sustainably sourced seafood, organic proteins, produce and eggs, and they leave a low carbon footprint, something that is so important to me. And that's not the only thing celebrated this month. Green Chef is also partnering with One Tree Planet to plant trees in northern Thailand to combat food insecurity in the vulnerable communities. One tree will be planted for every box sold. I don't know about you, but I am sometimes so busy. I love having both convenient and easy meal options, but also things that are good for me, my body, and the world around me. Go to greenchef.com slash AAW60 and use the code AAW60 to get 60% off plus free shipping. Again, that's greenchef.com slash AAW and use the code AAW60 to get 60% off plus free shipping. The number one meal kit for eating well. This show is brought to you by BetterHelp. As a fertility doctor, I ride the highs and the lows of each of my patients' experience. And I can tell you, That is not something that we are meant to do alone. Therapy is all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding. And getting to know yourself can be a lifelong process, especially because we are meant to grow and change and evolve. And this is why therapy has been so beneficial for me. And if it's something you have not experienced, I highly recommend that you do. BetterHelp.com can connect you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are into knowing and understanding yourself better. If you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's totally online. It is convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch at any time for no charge if that therapist is not the right one for you. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. That's betterhelp.com slash A-A-W today to get 10% off your first month. Again, betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash A-A-W. 
All right, so then in the luteal phase, what is now happening, again, LH pulses, therefore progesterone pulses. Also, this is why there is no set progesterone that equals a good luteal phase. When we check progesterone in the luteal phase, the sole and only purpose is to check if you ovulated. So progesterone can range anywhere from 3 to 40 nanograms, depending on when you check it in the luteal phase. If it's less than 3, you did not ovulate, or at least you didn't ovulate when you think you did. But there's no rule that says, oh, progesterone should be X in the luteal phase. That is an extrapolation of pregnancy data. And here is why this is different, and here is why this matters. Yes, you have progesterone in the luteal phase. You are going to notice progesterone side effects. You don't have these in the follicular phase because nothing is making progesterone. Do you know what makes progesterone in your body? A corpus luteum or a placenta, period, the end. So in the follicular phase, you have neither of these. You don't have progesterone. You have unopposed estrogen. That feels awesome. In the luteal phase, once progesterone gets on board, now your body is preparing for gestating. It is the progestational hormone, meaning pregnancy hormone. You're now hungrier. You have less energy. Your body's trying to conserve those calories and that energy to grow a baby. It wants you to sleep more. You're going to be a little less able to focus, a little more distracted. And then you also are going to notice you're going to feel bloated and you're going to have potentially sore boobs or bigger boobs. You may even be sensitive to certain smells or have food aversions. That can all come from progesterone. And if you noticed, those are very similar to early pregnancy symptoms. Because what happens is when a pregnancy comes and implants, it starts making HCG. That is released immediately from the cells of a pregnancy. So a pregnancy typically implants about a week after ovulation. That is when it is starting to grow in to the uterine wall. Now it hasn't made a connection to the maternal blood supply, and this is why you typically cannot get a positive pregnancy test at seven days post ovulation. Typically we're starting to see them a little bit after that, 9, 10 is a little more common to see a positive test. But HCG, once it's secreted into the bloodstream, it does something what we call rescues the corpus luteum. What this means is without the pregnancy, that corpus luteum, what used to be a follicle and what you ovulated from, it has an expiration date. It is going to die. It dies after about two weeks. Then your progesterone drops and you get a period. This is where the two-week wait got its name because of the two weeks between ovulation, having intercourse, until that corpus luteum is either going to die and you're going to get a period, or you're going to be pregnant and be able to get a positive pregnancy test. That is what the two-week wait is. Now, when you do get pregnant and that pregnancy starts to implant and starts to make HCG, HCG is now a constant stimulus of the corpus luteum. That's what we mean by rescuing it. And so instead of making progesterone in pulses from LH from the brain, now the corpus luteum has a constant and increasing stimulus of HCG because HCG doubles about every two days in a normal pregnancy. So HCG is getting stronger and stronger, not pulsing or going away. Therefore, the corpus luteum is getting more and more stimulated throughout this time period. So as that is happening, what we are seeing is that the body is responding with now a constant and increased production of progesterone. So now you are going to have an increase in those pregnancy symptoms. So when you get pregnant, maybe you don't have luteal symptoms, but when you get pregnant, now you do notice sore breasts and food aversions or sensitivity to smell or fatigue. That's because of this new very high progesterone. And we do have pregnancy related data showing us that certain progesterone levels indicate a pregnancy that has a greater likelihood of being normal or abnormal if it's lower. So having a high progesterone level is a good thing when you're pregnant. And there are certain cutoffs for pregnancy which make people feel better or worse or might make you want to supplement a pregnancy. Now this is also a big chicken and the egg phenomenon. So when you have a pregnancy that is genetically abnormal and it starts to implant, it likely is not going to secrete HCG at the same rate as a normal pregnancy is going to. Therefore, it is not stimulating as much progesterone and you are having low progesterone and this causes you to miscarry. Now, was it the low progesterone? Was that the problem? Or was it really that you weren't stimulated to make enough progesterone because of 
the abnormal pregnancy, right? Like the body has to have a way to communicate that this isn't a good pregnancy because humans cannot carry that many babies. You can't have genetically abnormal child over and over again because humans don't have litters. So it is likely that the HCG2 progesterone communication pathway is what tells our body, hey, this is not good. Progesterone's too low. We're going to start bleeding. So that's important to realize too. So when we check an HCG and a progesterone, the progesterone, and this is in natural cycles, I'm going to talk about IVF in a minute, but in natural cycles, this is giving us an indication of potentially the likelihood that the pregnancy is good. Now, the other thing to notice is that even genetically normal embryos may not have good progesterone, and this can all be due to implantation. Maybe it's not implanting well, maybe it's not stimulating that corpus luteum well. That is something that puts you at risk for other complications throughout a pregnancy likely due to the placenta not implanting really well. Now, can you have low progesterone that causes a miscarriage? Yes, clearly yes. Study done a long time ago in monkeys showed that in pregnant monkeys, if you took out the ovary where the corpus luteum was when the monkey was pregnant, it would miscarry. And that is because that placenta is not fully functional making progesterone until after nine weeks pregnant. So from that period of four weeks pregnant, which is after the two week wait until nine weeks, that early pregnancy is 100% dependent on progesterone production from the corpus luteum as stimulated by the pregnancy. So if the corpus luteum gets removed, maybe you have ovarian torsion and you go in for an emergency and they have to take out the cyst on your ovary, but that's your corpus luteum and you don't get progesterone given to you, you are going to miscarry. So this progesterone production from the corpus luteum is essential to early pregnancy development. That is how we bridge the gap from having regular periods into getting the placenta fully functional grown in. There is this gap period of five to six weeks where the corpus luteum has got to be able to do it stimulated from a pregnancy. So do some people have a hard time having functional corpus luteum and can that cause pregnancy loss or recurring pregnancy loss? Maybe. As I said, there's a lot of chicken and egg here, but when we think about it, if you are ovulating poorly. So I think of a bad corpus luteum, lack of a better word, is really coming from a bad follicle. And neither of these are really bad. What it really means is dysfunctional and it's on the spectrum of ovulatory dysfunction. If we use data from prolactin, prolactin is a hormone also made from the pituitary gland that changes how FSH and LH are secreted. So if your prolactin is a little high, you have a luteal phase defect, a shortening of your luteal phase because of poor stimulation of the corpus luteum. As your prolactin gets higher, you start skipping periods. You have irregular cycles. As it gets even higher, you have amenorrhea. And if we think about that as the spectrum of ovulation disorders from normal to a short luteal phase to irregular cycles or extended ovulatory intervals to amenorrhea or no periods. So this very first spectrum of an ovulation disorder has to do most likely with not ovulating a follicle that has the full capacity to be a functioning corpus luteum. So therefore it's not making as much progesterone. And the best support of some of this data is in people with recurrent miscarriage. If you come in and you get a positive pregnancy test and I give you progesterone because your progesterone is low, it is not going to make a difference. But if you have a history of miscarriages. And now I start progesterone in the luteal phase, three days after ovulation, I can see an improvement in your pregnancy rate. And why is that? Because at the time of pregnancy test, it's too late. I've already bypassed having that very essential implantation window. The implantation window, which is days five to nine after ovulation, opens and closes purely based on progesterone production. And it's really very, very precise. So if somebody is taking a progesterone herb, so some herb that has progesterone-like properties and they're taking it throughout the whole cycle, you're messing up your progesterone implantation window and you're not going to get pregnant. Or if you're taking compounded medication, I see this all the time, some estrogen progesterone cream or estrogen progesterone testosterone cream, and then you're shocked that you can't get pregnant. Somebody did you so dirty because you don't have an implantation window. The implantation window begins and ends all based on that first time 
you see progesterone. And we know this from IVF data. We start progesterone and we transfer embryos almost always on the sixth day of progesterone exposure because that is when they have the highest chance of becoming a baby in most people. So this window of how long you need to see progesterone before an embryo is inside the uterus is actually quite narrow and quite specific. So we need to start progesterone before that, when the body is going to start making progesterone, or at least not before you naturally would. And so to give room for error, that's why most people do three days after ovulation to start some progesterone. Therefore, you're getting a natural rise from your ovulatory follicle, but you're amplifying having enough of it for implantation to occur. As a busy fertility doctor, one thing that I have been trying to focus on this year is prioritizing my health and wellness. And one of these is staying hydrated. I run from room to room and procedure to procedure. And sometimes I can be so bad at drinking water and staying hydrated. And one reason why I love liquid IV is that I get five essential vitamins and get hydrated twice as fast than I would with water alone. It has such convenient packaging and the flavor gives it a little more variety than just drinking water. I also love the new strawberry lemonade flavor, and if you haven't tried it, you are missing out. Again, you have 12 delicious flavors to choose from. Five essential vitamins are included in one stick, including B vitamins and vitamin C. One liquid IV has three times the electrolytes of traditional sports drinks, and they are non-GMO, free from gluten, dairy, and soy. You can grab your liquid IV in bulk nationwide at Costco, or you can get 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use the code AAW at checkout. That's 20% off anything you order when you shop Better Hydration today using the promo code AAW at liquidiv.com. All right, friends, well, as summer is approaching, it is time to start shaving a little more frequently. I don't know about you, but this is something I hate. However, everything has changed since I've been using the Athena Club razor. It's not only the prettiest razor, it is also very gentle, leaving skin moisturized, smooth, and bump-free. Plus, the razor blade is surrounded by water-activated serum with shea butter and hyaluronic acid, which protects your skin. It's one of the holy grail for skincare. The best part is the razor kit is only $10, comes with two blade heads, a magnetic hook, and your choice of color. Mine is blue. And with Athena Club, you never have to think about blade refills because you choose how often you want your replacement blade shipped for free. Show your skin you care with the Athena Club Razor Kit. Head to athenaclub.com and use code AAW for 25% off your first order. Again, that's athenaclub.com and use code AAW for 25% off. Athena Club has also launched in Target stores nationwide, so make sure to check out the shaving aisle and buy their products in store in real life. So you open Google Chrome on your phone, you're hunting for a super rare first edition vinyl of a band you're obsessed with when you're supposed to be working. But this site you tapped on seems pretty shady. And Daryl from IT just jumped up from his desk. Oh no, he's coming your way. It's a good thing built-in malware protection keeps you safe and sound. Not from Daryl though, sorry. There's no place like Chrome. Download Google Chrome on your phone. All right, a couple of things before we dive in to IVF cycles and then just some tips. One is that this data and this nomenclature gets very confusing. Day one of a pregnancy is the day you start your period. Yep, that's before you ever ovulate. The time period when you ovulate, if you have normal or average 28-day cycles, you would ovulate around day 14, let's call it two weeks. You're two weeks pregnant the moment you ovulate. When I do an egg retrieval for a fresh transfer, the day I take the eggs out of the body is two weeks of a pregnancy dating. It's crazy. Then if you do a fresh embryo transfer five days later, two weeks, five days pregnant. And then by the time you get a positive pregnancy test nine days later, that is four weeks pregnant. For the average person, ovulation is two weeks pregnant. Two weeks later, after the two-week wait, is four weeks pregnant. So the time period where you miss your period is four weeks. The embryo is not four weeks old, right? This embryo is two weeks old 
right? It's barely anything. It has not divided into anything by the time you get a positive pregnancy test, yet you are four weeks gestation. And you can now see why there are some issues with six-week abortion bans. Not to get off topic, but if four weeks pregnancy is the moment you could first get a positive pregnancy test or you would miss your period, there are two weeks in between there. And if your periods are irregular or you're not tracking them that close, you may not even be aware before the six-week mark is gone. So that nomenclature is really misguided because a lot of people who are advocating against abortion and no matter what you feel, these are just facts, they will show a fetus that is six weeks of fetal age, which is very different than six weeks gestational age because there are two weeks different in what the embryo or the fetus really is versus what we say as common gestational age. And the reason why we never changed gestational age is because we didn't always know when ovulation or fertilization or implantation happened. We just knew when somebody had her last period. So the mounds of OBGYN data are all derived based on this last menstrual period dating as when the pregnancy started because that's what all people had to go on. So this does cause a lot of confusion. When we do IVF, the big thing to think about is that in IVF, you have fresh and frozen embryo transfers. We don't do tons of fresh transfers anymore, but if you do, the day of the egg retrieval is the day of ovulation for all purposes. That's the ovulation day. And then the embryo transfer is going to happen five days after if it's a day five transfer or three days after if it's a day three transfer. So ovulation is day zero. And then you count one, two, three, four, five. So ovulation is day two weeks. And then you have two weeks, one day, three day, four day, five days. So two weeks, five days is how far along you are pregnant the moment I put a five day old embryo inside your body. Now, you still have to wait to get your positive pregnancy test because you're two weeks, five days when the embryo goes in, it then has to start to try to implant and then HCG has to get into your bloodstream. So we still don't check pregnancy tests until typically that four week mark, which is usually about nine days afterward. So you still have a waiting game. It's a little less than two weeks in IVF, but we still call it the two week wait. Now, if we're doing a frozen embryo transfer, we are replicating getting to this exact same stage. So the short answer is I can do whatever I want to grow the lining. I can give you estrogen pills, patches, vaginal shots. I can make you ovulate. None of it really matters. I need to grow a lining. That's a lie. It matters based on you and your medical history and should be personalized to you. But what really matters for the timing is when you start making progesterone. So when we do cycles, if you're in a natural cycle, we have to trigger you so we know, or we have to follow you very closely so we know when that follicle is surging or ovulating so we can know when progesterone started to be secreted. Or in a medicated cycle, well, we well know when we first give you progesterone. And so this is allowing us to go in and transfer the embryo on the sixth day of progesterone exposure. And I'm not talking about an ERA right now or an endometrial receptivity analysis test. I will do an episode on that because the data is very interesting, but we're just talking about norms and averages and most people. So we will start progesterone, do a transfer on the sixth day of the progesterone, and then that is day five of the embryo, and then you still have nine days of your two-week wait before the positive pregnancy test. Also, quick note, in a natural cycle where you're ovulating, in any cycle where you're ovulating, in a fresh cycle where you're growing eggs, those cycles have follicles, you will make progesterone. Therefore, you can just supplement and give additional progesterone. So this is where you can take vaginal progesterone and it is fine. In a controlled or medicated cycle where you have no corpus luteum, you have no progesterone. And we're not supplementing, we have to replace. So we are now coming in replacing all of your progesterone. And that is why you need to have progesterone in oil as at least a part of your luteal phase support in those type of cycles. Whether it's the only thing you take or you do a combination, that's still up for debate, but it does appear some type of injectable progesterone is clearly the best. All right, so in the two-week wait, you are maybe pregnant and maybe not. And this is a very emotionally taxing time period. No matter if you're trying naturally or you're doing ovulation induction or you're doing IUIs or you're doing IVF, 
it doesn't really matter. This is where your mind starts to play tricks on you and so does your body. In almost all cycles with fertility treatments, we are giving you progesterone and your doctor should tell you this is one, going to make you feel early pregnancy symptoms and two, your period will not come while you're on this medication. So do not necessarily take that as a sign that you are 100% pregnant. I always say treat yourself pregnant in this time period. That is the kindest thing to do. Give yourself permission to say no to things. Allow yourself to sleep. That is what your body wants to do when it has progesterone. Eat lots of healthy foods. Can you eat other foods too? Yes, but you're already going to be bloating more. So you're going to be really sensitive to salt. So pay good attention and eat lots of fruits and vegetables, lots of nutrients to nourish that pregnancy. Try to avoid things that we know are toxic in this time period. Alcohol, smoking, marijuana. There's no reason to add extra variables into the pregnancy. And then there are things that can support getting good sleep, taking melatonin, certain types of vitamins and antioxidants, things like vitamin E can be really helpful in the corpus luteum's ability to make more progesterone. So when people talk about making more progesterone or more natural progesterone, really it's all about a diet high in fruits and vegetables, taking a multivitamin, getting good sleep, taking care of yourself, avoiding toxins and avoiding excess sugar and excess salt. I recommend you move your body but not aggressively. This is not the time for like hit workouts and trying to get your personal best. This is the time to just treat your body a little more kindly and with a little more grace. And the last thing here is I think it's a great, great thing if you have somebody in your life to share this with because the emotional aspect of fertility is so hard. And maybe that's a partner. Maybe it's a friend, a colleague, a therapist, a family member. It doesn't matter to me. But somebody that you're able to communicate with is really important. And this is why I think the fertility community has really bound it together because I've even seen this in my course, in our Facebook group, people supporting each other and getting information and being able to ask, am I crazy? Is this normal? Is this not? Without feeling judged by anybody. And there's so much support you can get from the online fertility community, even by being anonymous out there if you feel more comfortable that way, but by engaging and sharing with others. So please, infertility is isolating enough. Please do not feel like you have to do this by yourself. All right, well, now I'm going to answer a few of your fertility questions. Again, this is for fertility sake, our weekly Q&A. You can leave questions Mondays on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD, or you can call and leave a voicemail. I will tell you, we get thousands of questions on the Instagram. We get many fewer on the voicemail. So you do have a higher chance of it being answered on the voicemail. 657-229-3672. Again, that is 657-229-3672 for the voicemail. Let's go forward. Have you treated many post-breast chemo patients for fertility preservation or pregnancy? Is achieving a pregnancy tough? This is a really good question. The answer is... Yes, we definitely freeze eggs and embryos for patients before or during they go through treatment, and then we try to help them get pregnant afterward. If you have something frozen, then we are looking at that. And if you didn't freeze anything and maybe you just weren't at a place or your doctor never told you about it, that's okay too. So the first thing is if you didn't go through fertility preservation, but you went through standard AC chemotherapy for breast cancer, you now have a 20% chance of being an ovarian failure after you're done with chemo. So if you're not having periods, I am concerned. If you are having periods, that's reassuring, but it doesn't mean you have a normal ovarian reserve. You might still have a drop. So we want to do testing to see what your AMH or your egg count is going to be. From that, our game plan is going to be based on your cancer game plan. Are you on a long-term hormonal management on something like tamoxifen? Can you get pregnant or do we have to wait five years for that to be up? Is it safe for you to carry or Do you have a type of cancer that you really need to have a gestational carrier? Can we still go through and get eggs or embryos now? The scenarios are really immense. The short answer is that we help people with cancer have their families, but it is such a personalized situation. You were always served best by going to see somebody earlier. If you didn't freeze eggs or embryos, but you do have a history of cancer and had chemo, and you want kids someday, but not now, go see us now. Let us talk to you now, see what we're working with, do some testing. You might still be at a place where an intervention now could make a difference for later. If my OPK says peak for three days, does that mean I didn't ovulate? Well, what do y'all say? For the most part, you ovulated. Just the first day of peak is all that matters. It might read peak on and off the entire luteal phase. So I would take that one day of peak and say that you ovulated 
the next day. The only exception here is people who have very refractory PCOS, and this is why I do not recommend using OPKs if you have irregular periods, like super irregular periods, because people with bad PCOS can have an endogenously very high LH, and that can confuse the test. It really shouldn't, like the difference in peak and high for PCOS truly are quite different, but If you're noticing peaks lots of times in what should be your follicular phase, the test is no longer reliable for you. How do you handle the feeling when your best friend is pregnant and you still aren't? This is a really hard one. There's no right answer, but I'm a big believer that holding things in and keeping secrets only puts distance between you and the people you love. So being very upfront and honest is going to be the number one best way to handle this. I would tell my best friend, I'm so happy for you. I can't wait to see you blossom in this pregnancy and give birth. And I'm here to support you. But I do want you to know I'm still struggling and trying to get pregnant myself. And maybe we can have a system where before you share pregnancy updates, you ask if this is a good time for me to receive that news. Because maybe it's not. Maybe I had a negative test or got some bad news myself. And that is going to already open up this honesty so there's no secret or hiding or separating you and your friend. In your heart, you're going to be jealous. Just believe the mantra. Give out good karma. It's going to come back to you. And try not to let that be something that truly puts a wedge between you. Is letrozole helpful if you already ovulate? Yes and no. If you have unexplained infertility, so all your stuff is normal, and you ovulate, adding letrozole on with timed intercourse is not helpful. Now, letrozole might be helpful if there's any concern for a luteal phase defect. Maybe your cycles are short, maybe you have spotting in the luteal phase, or there is concern that your luteal phase is less than 12 days. Then perhaps, like we mentioned earlier, ovulating a better follicle might lead to a better corpus luteum and help that luteal phase defect even though you're actually ovulating. So letrozole works by telling the brain to send out a stronger signal of FSH. If, however, you have regular ovulation, you're able to detect it, there's no luteal phase issue, letrozole alone is not going to be helpful unless you're purposely taking a dose of letrozole in order to ovulate two or more eggs and combining that with an IUI. Is human growth hormone effective in improving egg quality? That is a really good question. So there was a study done actually by my partner who looked at patients who had normal ovarian reserve but had poor egg quality than one would anticipate based on their cycle and did nothing different in the two cycles, the exact same protocol, no trigger changes, no size changes, just added human growth hormone and actually saw an improvement in eggs retrieved and blastocyst ratio and normal embryos. So even though HGH is not approved because it hasn't been associated with a higher live birth rate yet, it has been shown to help with egg quality in IVF cycles. Not everybody's going to use it or feel comfortable, but I'm a big believer in using it for people who we might suspect have poor egg quality or who have a lower egg count. How long do you suggest waiting between egg retrievals for egg banking? That is really going to depend on how many eggs you have. In general, the fewer eggs you have, the less time you need to wait and the easier it is to back into another cycle without any negative consequence and potentially a higher rate of success. If, however, you have a high number of eggs, the ovary is going to need time to heal, and so you might need to take a month off to let that ovary heal up before you go through a cycle again. All right, and our last question is, what fertility treatments do you recommend for somebody with hypothalamic amenorrhea? Hypothalamic amenorrhea is when your brain now is not sending out FSH or LH, so you're not stimulating an egg to grow. You actually need to take gonadotropins, which are FSH or an FSH-LH combination. These are injectable hormones like folistim, gonal, or menopure. This can be very difficult to get just one or two eggs to grow. It is very common to over-respond and high order multiples are a complication. A lot of doctors don't do gonadotropin ovulation induction and find that it is much safer in this situation and have higher success rates to go to IVF because in IVF, the eggs are stimulated to grow by using gonadotropin. All right, friends. Well, I hope this helped. Hope this episode shed some light on that two week wait period. The number you can call if you want to leave a question for a voicemail is six. 5-7-2-2-9-3-6-7-2. And again, you can also ask your questions Mondays at Natalie Crawford, MD. Thanks friends. Thank you all for listening to As a Woman. 
It would mean so much if you could rate, review, and follow the podcast to be notified of new episodes every Sunday. I hope you learned something new, and I hope you share it with someone in your life. Be sure to follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD, and check out the YouTube channel Natalie Crawford MD. If you're interested in becoming a patient, you can also follow Fora Fertility. I'm so thrilled to have you here, part of the community that amplifies others as a woman. If you're looking for another surprising investigation into the criminal justice system, check out Bear Brook from New Hampshire Public Radio, hosted by me, Jason Moon. Bear Brook is back with a new season and a new case. Jason Carroll is serving life in prison for a murder he says he didn't commit. More than 30 years later, is it still possible to get to the truth? And who gets to tell it? Listen to season two of Bear Brook wherever you get your podcasts.